Well, we have nine of 15. So that, that looks pretty good to me. Um, well, obviously we'll keep allow, I mean, people keep joining as they're able to. Hello everyone. Welcome to our second meeting. It's hard to believe, is this really only the second? Um, I'm Grace Rink, the director of the Office of Climate Action, Sustainability and Resiliency. And you may or may not hear, I have a little bit of a head cold. That's my reward for re-entering society, um, which is completely unfair. Here I am, I've got, it's what, hundred degrees outside and I have cough drops with me. So um, there may be times when I have to go off screen and mute myself, but rest assured, I'm still here and listening. So why don't we do the usual? Let's go around the horn and, uh, and do our uh, welcome and good news. And it, we'll just go ahead and pick on each other if that's all right. And I'll, I'll start by saying, I'm, I won't say that I'm sick is certainly not a good news, but in all the years that I lived in Chicago in my early twenties, I, I was a subscriber to a local theater company with one of my best friends from college. And we, uh, we kept that going for many years. And of course that theater went dark during COVID, but they created an online subscription where they were showing videos of their performances. And she and I have kept that going. And we watched our last performance yesterday. And it was just a really nice thing to keep that going during the pandemic. And also, you know, a nice way to still be supporting the arts from home. That was very enjoyable. All right, so I'll pass it on to Jay. Hey everybody, uh, Jay from uh, Co-Chair of Science and Research. Um, uh, I've been able to take some time off and see family and I'm uh, currently at the beach in New York and it's uh, it's happy hour here so it's good to be with you all and uh, excited to uh, get this meeting going. If you could call on someone else it'd be great. Okay, uh, Stuart Anderson. Hi, Stuart Anderson with Transportation Solutions. I'm the co-chair of the Sustainable Transportation Committee. Um, gosh, there's lots of good news. Um, I do have my son back from college for the whole summer, um, which is really nice. It's been probably three years since he's ever spent uh, more than just a week here. <laughs> so that's a good news item. I'm going to pass it to Lori. Hi everyone, I'm Lori Matthews. I'm co-chair of the Natural Resources Committee. And my good news is this is Butter and she's a kitten that I'm fostering and she just makes me smile all day. Her sister Biscuit's around here. So I'll pass it to Stephen. Well, hello, Miss Butter, was that her name? Um, so I'm Stephen Shepard and I am the co-chair of the Buildings and Homes subcommittee. And my good news is I was actually able to get out camping this past weekend and get re-energized to come back and do the work that we're all working on, not only here, but in our real jobs too. And uh, I had never been to 11 Mile Canyon. And so Grace, I know you're fairly new to Denver and I would highly, 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 highly recommend it. It was absolutely Beautiful. Beautiful. And it's one of our state parks. And so we went in through the national forest side, I think it was. So, um, and so I'll pass it to my co-chair, Aaron, just to get our committee out of the way. All right, hi, thanks. Um, 11 Mile Canyon is one of my favorite places to fish. And, and you know that it's, um, they have this fish there have this special ability to swim right up next to your feet, but never bite on anything you're throwing in the water. Um, I also got to go camping this past weekend. That's my, that's my good news. I was up at Lake Granby. And unfortunately that, I mean, we've got the smoke in the air from the fires, but it, it made for some beautiful sunsets up there. So that was fun. Oh, you're still right. calling. Uh, I'll throw it to Marcel. Hey, I'm Marcel. Um, I work for the Peace Jam Foundation. I'm one of the at-large members. Um, and my good news, I think, is I also went camping this past weekend. Uh, we went to Cold Springs. Um, it was a lot of fun. Um, it was my first, like, I moved to, to Denver in December. So it was my first, like, Colorado camping experience. And it was, it was amazing. 
Um, and I, I hopped on a little late, so I don't know who hasn't gone yet. If you haven't gone, I'm calling on you. Well, on my screen, Lisa's next to you. So we'll call on Lisa. Thanks, Grace. I'm Lisa, co-chair of science and research. My good news is also travel related. I finally got to go home to San Diego and other parts of California for the first time in maybe three years. Um, and uh, I will call on Naomi. Thanks, Lisa. Um, Naomi Amaha, I'm the co-chair of the Sustainable Transportation Subcommittee. I did not go camping this weekend, but I did go hiking and went to the Colorado Black Arts Festival, some of my favorite festivals in Denver, and City Park Jazz. So it was a very active weekend. <laughs> and I'm going to call on Armando. Hi, everybody. I'm Armando from the Energy Committee. Um, my good news is I got to play a lot of music this last month. Um, my band, Brothers of Brass, we're a New Orleans style brass band. We play a lot in the streets. And, after shows, uh, we flew out some musicians from New Orleans, uh, five of them. So I've been getting to get out and make a lot of music um, with uh, some really authentic people. And um, I don't know if Anna's gone yet. Hey, hey, no, I have not. Hey, y'all. My name is Anna McDevitt. I'm on the Energy Committee with my pal Armando. Um, I use she, her pronouns. And my good news is that I finally have my first veggies of the season in my garden. So I got a jalapeno, a couple of cherry tomatoes. I'm very excited about it. So thanks for letting me share that with you. Let's see, um, Taylor, have you gone yet? I have not. Uh, I'm Taylor Mullers. I work at the Office of Climate Action, Sustainability and Resiliency. Here to help out with any kind of tech stuff and just a communications outreach person for the office. So um, if you have any needs, feel free to reach out. And then I don't know if there are any other committee members. Kira hasn't gone. Oh, Kira, there you are. Hey y'all, sorry, I'm having internet trouble. Um, Kira Jackson, I'm on the Care J Committee, which stands for Community, uh, Community Adaptability, Resiliency, um, and environmental justice. It's a long name. <laughs> Carrie J. That's a committee. Um, so one of the co-chairs on that. Um, and my bit of good news. Um, it's good news. I'm just super stressed out because it's coming up real soon. My fiance and I picked up our marriage license because we are getting married next week. Yes. That is exciting. And uh, if I can interrupt for just one second. I know you had said you weren't able to make it today. Are you able to stay the whole time or are you time constrained? Wonderful, thank yeah. you. And Mike, since we see you here, you're gonna to have to go. Tell us your good news. Hi everyone, uh, Mike Salisbury. I work uh, with Naomi and Stewart on the Sustainable Transportation Committee um, in the Climate Action Office. Um, my good news is we took some time off and actually got to see I had a really nice week in Illinois with my in-laws who hadn't seen their grandkids for about a year and a half. So it was really fun to have the, uh, you know, grandparents around and be able to spoil the grandkids for a few days. So that was a lot of fun and nice to get away out of Colorado. All right, wonderful. I think that was everybody. We didn't, if, you, if we missed you, raise your hand. Great, well, um, I think we're gonna keep today's uh, meeting pretty simple. But I hope that you did see that we're going to, I'm asking each of you to actually report out from your committees and tell us a little bit about what you've been working on and what you have been finding useful, uh, especially in any tools you've been using. And I will also start by saying, we've heard from everybody. We would like to, we would like to have more information circulating amongst us about what we're doing. And so the liaisons talked last week and we decided at the very least the very first thing we could do is start a monthly email to everyone on all the committees that will include a, you know, at least a couple of sentences about what each committee is doing. And so we're going to launch that in August. So while you're talking, I'm going to take notes. And if I have questions, I'll ask questions. But otherwise, this will hopefully become the first of our uh, group messages that we can begin sharing across our committees. And so if you don't mind, I'm going to take this in alphabetical order. And so that means buildings and homes, you get to go first. 
All right. Well, we actually, we had a meeting scheduled for right before this that we have postponed um, because we're going to be joining with the Energized Denver Task Force technical briefings later in the month. Um, but uh, so <laughs> I have to go back and I have to remember our last meeting and, and there's a lot of intersections between some of the groups that are that are working together on these things like the Energized Denver Task Force as well as the, the Buildings and Homes Committee. Um, and please, Stephen, help me out because I'm going to need you here. But we had talked a lot about the um, the Energized Denver Awards and acknowledging um, projects around town that have really been um, notable and commendable for for work in the space. Um, we put a there, there's a call for nominations that are open, and we're we're really trying to broaden. Um, Broaden the, the the applicants or, or the, the nominees for those awards, specifically around things like um, uh, um, diversity and just interesting projects that are specifically affecting communities uh, that are maybe have been underrepresented. Um, so a lot of interesting things going on there. And um, and I put the link to the Energized Denver Awards in the chat. Oh, thank you, Stephen. Um, and. Um, what can you can you get give us the next point, Stephen? I'm gonna hand it off to you for this one. Okay. So um, there's been a couple of other things that have been going on. So the besides the Energize Denver Awards and Task Force meetings, which are going on, the Renewable Heating and Cooling Plan was released. Um, I'll put a link of that in the in the chat as well. Um, and then benchmarking, they've got 86 percent of the buildings have attempted to comply so far. And as hopefully most of you know, it's the taking the benchmarking and the Energized Denver Task Force is then creating the performance measurements to go along with that for us to meet the energy goals. Um, and so even though uh, you know the buildings have been doing well with their with their um, reduction in energy use, we've been, been getting so many more new buildings coming online that that's why, um, we're having to look to see what we can do to continue to push existing buildings. Um, and then because the net zero energy uh, plan is obviously directed towards the new, the new buildings. And then the city and county is also beginning their 2021 energy and green code updates. Um, and so there is a um, uh, application process online right now if you want to participate in any of the committees that includes fire codes green codes existing building new building I mean there's like grace I think there's like eight different <laughs> different groups going on simultaneously am I right in that so um, they're going to need lots of input from folks and so that's kind of where we stand um, and the next meeting that we have will review and discuss what everybody heard during the stakeholder meetings. And those are not the only stakeholder meetings that are happening. There are stakeholder meetings for specific areas of industry. So for instance, I represent BOMA. And so Downtown Denver Partnership and BOMA and a couple of other organizations are doing a stakeholder meeting. And um, I think you know some of the other folks on the, the task force are holding um, stakeholder meetings for their industries as well. I think and that wraps us up, Ms. Grace. Yeah, there were also a couple of things I had mentioned early on that um, the Energized Denver Ta Task Force is putting on some technical or some briefing and comment sessions that are available to the public. I'll drop those uh, meeting links into the chat. And uh, they're doing a great thing. They're making one very technical for you know the technical folks and people who are really, really interested in, in the details in that way. And then a less technical briefing that's more about impacts for building owners and for community um, members and, and things that are just less into the weeds. And actually, Stephen, if you have that up, if you could drop those into the chat, I can as well. It's just hard. I can't multitask with talking and, <laughs> and cutting and in pasting. The next, yeah, the next few minutes we can get them up there. Okay, great. So July 21st, July 21st, 1 to 2.30 p.m. is the technical uh, session. And then July 28th, 9 a.m. Uh, 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. is the um, sort of less technical focused uh, briefing and comment session. So I'd encourage anyone who has the opportunity to join those meetings. And if I may, I just want to make sure I got this straight. 
So your committee decided to not have a July meeting and instead to direct everyone's time if they're available to those two meetings instead, is that right? Yes, and then right. we're going to regroup in, in August after those meetings. Okay, great. We, we wanna make sure that, the, that our subcommittee has a chance to provide input to the Energized Denver Task Force prior to that task force getting to its final recommendations. That's helpful, thank you. And I think, you know, again, in these early days of um, this new reimagined SAC, it's helpful to use that as a model. Um, I think other committees are also interested in determining how they can or should be interacting with other boards and commissions and advisory groups of the city. And so that's, like I said, just a good example for us to, to know about. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for them? All right, well then let's move on to Kara J. Kara, you're up. And just so you know, I have, I think I have, or I will have momentarily, if you'd like to use the Jamboard, I can pull oh, that up. Awesome, I, I pulled it up myself. So thank you, that would okay, be awesome. Good. You're welcome to share. You should have, you should have screen sharing ability. Okay, let me double check. My home Wi-Fi is being a little, a little difficult. Can you guys see that? Yes. Awesome, groovy. All right, so our last um, meeting, this first and foremost was our first meeting without Sarisa. Um, we miss her so, but we are super, super thankful for Grace um, just stepping into um, that position, helping us um, continue developing our work, continue developing our committee. And so excited for everything that is coming up um, and just, you know, the opportunities that we have before us. And so the first meeting that we had, we really spent a lot of time learning about the fund and what are the opportunities within the fund and how does it operate and kind of where is our position as a committee that works in equity, that works with community, you know, what is our basically a space <laughs> within all the other committees work. Um, and then also within this office overall. And so we started having those conversations, started learning more about that. But this past meeting, we really wanted to focus on dreaming and really dreaming big. All of us come from different organizations, different backgrounds, focused on different facets you know, of our community out here in Denver. And so we wanted to bring to the table um, some dreams that we have for our, our organizations, ourselves, our neighbors, when it comes to um, um, sustainability, when it comes to um, community engagement, when it comes to X, Y, and Z around um, this committee's work. And so what we did is we just spent a couple of minutes dreaming, my favorite thing to do, just dreaming, the wildest dreams. If we could just solve it all, what, what are we going to do? <laughs> and so we got some amazing um, dreams here that um, Grace and the team went back just to kind of start bucketing for us. Um, but some of them talking about um, having promotora programs to educate neighbors on um, things that are coming out of this office or maybe initiatives that are coming from the community. Um, also having more community gardens, definitely clean water, especially for our house neighbors, um, more environmental education in the public school system et cetera, et cetera. And so all of these dreams intersect with all your committee. So if you guys want a copy of this information, let us know, we'd be happy to send it over. Um, but that was the first dream. And so then we talked about, okay, so what do we need to get there? We have this big, awesome dream that we're, we're gonna go for, we're gonna tackle. What are the things that we need from the community, from ourselves, from this office in order to make this happen? And so again, we had all of that information about to get bucketed out, um, whether it was specific more to like the RFP process that are coming up that we're starting to develop. Maybe it's more so just like general community engagement, marketing, um, that whole education piece. But start, you know, building um, the, the stones in our path to help us get us to our dream. And then the last question that we were talking about was, um, specifically for this office, how can we just ensure that there's better reciprocity between the community, better communication um, between the community and the office and vice versa? 
Um, and how do we make sure that community really feels a part um, of this work and not just, you know, as a stakeholder, like <laughs> they're the ones helping lead this, they're the, help, the ones helping co-create this. How do we build that kind of relationship between this office and this committee, um, committee, um, community, et cetera? And so again, started putting all of this information in buckets, which we so appreciate. And so all this information went back to Grace and the team, um, and they're looking and diving um, into these with conversations um, amongst themselves about what are some potential funding opportunities and some immediate steps that we can start taking as we're pulling out and putting together RFPs. Um, and so that's that's kind of where we are right now. We're looking to continue these conversations, shore up a lot of them, looking to hear back from Grace and the team about um, some of the conversations that they had so that we can continue to move forward and um, putting some of this stuff into action, um, whether it's more so on the community side or within the office or even both, um, that's gonna be that's gonna be our work for now. I think I I think I got everything. <laughs> it was a really big meeting, but <laughs> that was it. Thank you. It was a big meeting, but it was really helpful. And I appreciated, you know, for myself after the fact going and, and trying to do this organizing because I mean I really had to put on a, that brain of okay, how do these how can these come together, mm -hmm. right? How do how do we narrow it down? And then I think, yeah, the next the next piece is then our staff has to come back and say, we read this and here's how we, what we think we can do next. And I, I would like to add that two things. One, we are having miniature versions of this discussion with other community-based right. organizations just in our regular interactions. And then we're gonna do a conversation not unlike that when I get to the re report out for our office too. So we'll have this discussion here. So Kara, it was just such a great, Thing that you put together this Jamboard and it was really very simple and everyone here should know that when the Jamboard first started all that was on each one was just her question at the top and by the end of the session the whole each of those slides was completely filled with all these different post-its so I think the the group was really engaged by the conversation yeah we we have a pretty kick butt group you know a little biased but it's pretty kick butt but thank you so much <laughs> does anybody want to ask any questions of Kira I can't see all of you, so. Um, Kara, this is Lori. I, I just love your Jamboard. Grace showed it to me earlier today. And um, I, I, I guess as you have pieces under this that relate to other committees, let us know. I saw earlier there was a resource piece, but also I love that you're gonna stop Tabor. I just think that's really admirable and good luck. Girl, we're gonna do it, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks so much, Kira. Um, okay, next then we're going to the energy group, energy committee. Hey y'all, this is Anna. Um, so Armando and I can tag team this a little bit. It's been really fun to see what y'all have been up to too. Um, so for our first couple of meetings, the energy committee has been focused on mostly structure and priorities. Um, we have a lot of really great folks on our on our team um, and we're trying to figure out how we can you know honor everyone's um, values and visions coming into this um, and so one of the things i want to highlight that we're thinking about moving forward is um, you know we kind of came up with a vision for uh, our work together and um, lynn's at a place where our energy committee will help to inform the city's efforts to achieve equitable access to and deployment of energy resources that affordably and reliably achieves 100% renewable energy in Denver by 2030. So really focusing around making sure that we are meeting that 100% renewable energy goal by 2030, but doing it in a way that's equitable and accessible for, for all of Denver's residents. Um, and we have a couple of priorities that we've established within the umbrella of that vision. Um, mainly like main priority, most people have joined this group because they just really wanna make sure we hit that 100% goal. So we're looking at recommending policies, incentives and programs to achieve that goal. Um, but within that, we have a couple of other priorities, including um, increasing that access to affordable clean energy options, um, as well as adopting a really holistic view of Denver's connected energy systems. So um, we see you know, a, a big need to quickly 
clean up our electric generation resources so that we can work together with all of you on the systems integration that's needed to um, clean up all the sectors of Denver's, Denver's economy to combat climate change. Um, and so we're having conversations right now about how, you know, kind of identifying some of the barriers that exist um, between where we are now and Denver reaching its 100% goal. You know, I'll say notably Excel Energy, which is the, um, as we all probably know, the electricity provider for Denver is going through an electric resource planning process. So kind of a really good opportunity or window of opportunity to be having this conversation about, you know, where Denver sees itself um, in the next 10 years. Um, electric generation wise as Excel makes some of those plans. Um, and then maybe Armando, can I pass it over to you to talk a little bit about some of the like com committee structuring that we're working on right now? Yeah, definitely. So on the last meeting, we did a lot of priority and vision setting, um, like Anna said. Um, I think we actually drafted our vision statement, which uh, may or may not be ready to share. Um, but the, um, in addition to that, we started drafting some subcommittees as well because some committee members reached out and they were interested in maybe maximizing the time resources. Um, we have a lot of really like go-getter uh, type of uh, committee members that are really looking to do more and offer more um, volunteering time. So definitely not going to say no to that. So we put out some surveys. Um, came up with some, and it came up with some really great survey questions to get everybody engaged. Um, and we ended up finding uh, that three committees, um, we're gonna task out some, some resources there. Um, mainly the, we're gonna have a SAC liaison committee, uh, hopefully to reach out to everyone else, um, all the other committee, yeah, subcommittees, subcommittees, um, as well as a education committee. Um, our field, I mean, each one of our fields is, is pretty diverse and, and multifaceted. The energy field uh, or the energy subcommittee is very like all encompassing and encompasses everything from right technology to policy to um, social deployment to, you know, there's, there's a lot to learn there. So um, we thought it'd be helpful to have a, a committee or a sub subcommittee whose um, role is just to, you know, reach out to information. We have some people passionate about ed education. Um, and then finally, we have a um, community resource engagement um, committee uh, within the energy committee, who, you know, which is, uh, you know, it, I guess, you know, it's kind of weird talking to the other subcommittees to mention that we're like reflecting themselves within ourselves. But I think it's just useful to, uh, to get everybody on the same page and, and maximize um, cross pollination. So that's some of what we're doing structurally to uh, set ourselves up for success in that, in that way. Can I ask a question? I want to make sure I heard it right. So of your three subcommittees, you said the first one was an SAC liaison committee. Can you describe more of what that means? Yeah, so um, well, the way we envisioned that was to have our committee members be able to reach out to committee members from other SAC committees and maybe just discuss how the proposals might um, you know, encompass multiple committees and um, in what ways we could just come together um, as a community to maybe, you know, you know, back the same proposal. I don't know if Anna has a, another way to describe that. Well, I'll just add, so we've okay. led decision-making on our committee through, both through conversations monthly, but also through surveys between monthly meetings. So it's been a really helpful way for Armando and I to see what people are feeling and thinking and wanting to do that they're maybe not able to say out loud during meetings and synthesize that into next steps. And so one of the themes that we've noticed is people are just really interested in systems integration. So they're not just thinking about where does wind, solar and storage fit in our community, but they wanna make sure that it's fitting in with all the great work that your committees are doing. And while Armando and I kind of saw ourselves as um, kind of the assumed SAC liaison, uh, I guess positions on our subcommittee, it turns out there's a lot of folks on our committee that were really excited to have those conversations with some of the folks on your committees too. And so um, when we did a survey to figure out what kind of subcommittee subcommittees folks might want to be on in the energy group. Um, the most popular one was the SAC liaison subcommittee. They want to get to know the folks that are on your committees. And so we're excited to help support that to happen. Um, you know, I think just hearing what some of the things that y'all are up to, I do see some really fun opportunities for overlap, especially here with some of the stuff that you were saying on the Care J committee and some of the community outreach that I think we're hoping to do and listening we're hoping to do to better understand how Denver community members want to, to be the city with 100% goals, things like that. So we're gonna try it, we'll see how it goes. We're actually having the next kind of subcommittee, subcommittee follow-up conversation tomorrow at our monthly meeting. Um, 
and we'll we'll certainly report back on on the next steps there in our on this next meeting. Well, I think that all sounds really cool, and I think that you'll find a lot of good reception um, from other committee members or members of other committees who also would like to engage because I think that's a theme that we're hearing from a lot of people. And I I have to say from from where I sit, I know that this entrepreneurial nature that we're allowing all of this to have can be a little discomforting at times, but I love where this is going. And I, I really like the organic growth. And so I appreciate, I appreciate everyone who is willing to roll along with that because I think this is taking shape in a really nice way. Yeah, well, uh, thanks anyone for giving else us the space for, to do that, you know? Anyone else have questions for Anna or Armando? Thank you, Taylor, for the reminder. All right. Well, then we'll go to resource management and we have Lori today. Hi, everyone. This is, I don't know, it's fascinating hearing echoes of what our committee is going through with all the others, some of the same ideas and some of the same struggles. I think Margaret's not here today, so I'll try and do this. Um, by myself, but I, I wanted to say for us, it, it has often felt like we're being fed through a fire hose because we have such a broad mission and, um, and a lot of agencies and a lot of players. So, you know, we are looking at, um, we have focused it down. We had water quality, increased green space, habitat, improved soil quality, promote sustainable land use, reduce solid waste generation, and increase landfill division, diversion, which, you know, that's a, that's a very wide, wide bucket. Um, and we're making progress. We had, we've had three meetings so far, and I will tell you our last meeting was outdoors at Ruby Hill. Um, it was great, Grace joined us. The, I don't know how many of you have met in person, but the incremental increase in energy was phenomenal. People were so excited. It was just really a wonderful, nobody left at the end. Everybody stayed and talked and networked. And so we are going to move to in-person, uh, I believe in the web building. So we'll have Zoom as well, but that's seemed to be a big jump for us. Uh, we started by, you know, looking at these buckets, we did a survey and asked everybody to sort of rank their interest in the five different areas and then to give us their best comments. So a little bit like the jam board. And when I saw that board this morning, I asked Grace if we could send her our comments and see if she sees the same kind of organization she could help us with because uh, you know they really you really do have to think three-dimensionally with all these comments because they're both programs and they're specific to a topic. Uh, so I, I look forward to sort of sorting that through. Um, the way that we are now focusing our meetings is we're taking about half the meeting to learn about something going on. So we've been talking a lot about the pay as you throw concept, which of course would allow us to integrate um, both recycling and composting into uh, what Denver offers. We've looked at food waste, I think, a lot about tree canopy is coming up. So those are sort of some of our subject areas. And we, so we take half the time to meet as a group and then we are now broken into just two subcommittees. One is on parks and green infrastructure and the other is on waste. So that, and, and we are trying to develop, sort of take one, the climate action plan to the agency plans where, where we have them and ideas of the committee and sort of come up with our idea of everything that's out there that we should be aware of and then trying to focus down from that. And, and that's, a, that's a big, big task for us. I'd say we're right in the middle of that. Um, so what we're trying to do is look at how can we focus, how can we um, support what agencies are doing. In our case, Parks is doing an awful lot and we need to know about it and see see where it matches with our goals. Um, same with other agencies. And then we're also trying to look at it through four lenses, the lenses of equity and workforce and also um, education and outreach. So uh, 
lots of pieces in the air for us right now. I think we everybody just was so heartened by this last meeting. And um, I think I'll stop with that. I just say we're, we're really excited as we're starting to um, get our hands around a little more both how we can help CASR and, and how our committee members can all be involved. And I was there, so I'm just gonna add a couple of thoughts. Um, you know, one thing that I think is challenging about the resource management uh, committee's charge is that our office doesn't have uh, subject matter experts in all of the fields that they touch. Yeah. But one of the ways that we've compensated for that is that committee has gone out of its way to, or, and our liaison has gone out of the way to make sure that there are representatives from those other agencies at those meetings. So at the meeting this past Friday, there was a representative from Parks there who was able to sit with that subcommittee and really get into the weeds, right, Lori, on mm -hmm. what you guys were interested in. And then we have waste experts. We have plenty of those on our team. So they were there. But then also the person who works on food waste policy uh, was there as well. And so that's something else I think would be good for all the other committees to keep in mind is your liaison is ready, willing, and able to reach out to other to colleagues in other agencies to bring in that not just subject matter expertise, but bring in the people who are working on the issues that you are most interested in, if those people are not us. And um, I think that's you know resource management absolutely needs that. Other committees might find it useful too. I think we found um, the parks person, for instance, sort of said, well, I didn't want to come to your meeting and just say, yeah, we know we're doing most of that. And, and she was so glad to be asked, you know, what, what are you doing and, and what are your priorities and what do you care about? And so I, I think that was a big leap forward for us. Um, unfortunately, we have about seven subject matter experts. So um, that, there's a lot of depth and breadth for us to tackle. But I, I feel very strongly we're on our way and it's been fascinating hearing about what others are doing. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Lori? All right, thanks Lori. Moving on to science and research. So I'll start us off and then tag team with Jay. Um, so science and research, talk about cross-cutting folks. We have, uh, you know, academics and scientists from so many different disciplines. And so we really do cut, cut across a lot of topics. And that's one thing that's um, come up and I hear it echoed also, like Lori said, and what others have shared today already is that one thing that that keeps coming up for our committee, we've met twice and are scheduling another one for um, hopefully later in July, is this desire to, if there are needs that other committees have um, to, to let us know, we would we'd love this idea of trying to, to provide if what you need is, you know, an, an academic's expertise or a scientist's expertise to bring that um, and offer that. So, no, I'm good. Good? Mm -hmm. Armando, can you mute? All right, or Taylor, can you mute him? There you go, thanks. Great. Um, so for example, when um, even looking at Kira's Jamboard just now, I think that's, I was already taking notes from it. So Kira, I would love to receive a copy of it because there's things on there that um, I think could be great for our committees to connect on. Um, one of them was, you know, connecting communities with climate change experts. And then there's so many different topics on that Jamboard where I think, you know, some of our committee members, um, because they're so interested in sharing their expertise, if it's helpful, might be interested in taking a topic. And if you need a, um, I don't know, Jay, tell me if you don't agree, but I feel like what one thing I've heard is like, if you need a, a, a summary of the latest evidence on this topic or direction, that's something people could provide. Um, so that's more just echoing, you know, kind of weaving with things I've heard today. As far as structure, we've um, set up Slack for our committee and have um, channels set up for our subcommittees like Armando and Anna, we also use some surveys in between um, meetings to gather more input. And um, Grace, I'll put our subcommittee names in the chat 
for, for note purposes as well, but we have um, uh, an allowable uses for the Climate Protection Fund subcommittee that's um, trying to, especially this summer um, into the early fall, try to weigh in on um, the criteria, metrics, et cetera, for the allowable uses for the Climate Protection Fund. Um, an engagement with other committees, subcommittee, so very similar to, to something we've heard today and from Armando and Anna, um, a monitoring and evaluation subcommittee. Um, and then our most popular one, if I remember the survey right, was our best practices um, subcommittee where people were, are looking at um, other cities, what's, you know, just some, synthesizing that evidence around what's working, um, what's not working, what not to try as well. Um, so we're all for this engagement with each other, I think, across the different committees. Um, Jay, do you want to, uh, yes, Anna, definitely. Um, Jay, do you want to add on there to anything? Yeah, subcommittee, subcommittee. No, I think, you know, the, the thing we talked about was, you know, the real value of all of us serving on these committees is to connect with each other. So I think the greater connectivity uh, the better that seemed to be a real um, commodity, you know, a real asset for doing this. So we really were, you know, encouraging that and trying to maximize that. And then also think about like, what is it that we want to do? Because I think a lot of people came in with like, well, what should we do? What are we supposed to do? And we kind of changed that conversation. It was like, well, what do you want to do? Because, um, I, you know, I think that we um, have, you know, and some undifferentiated lumps of clay to kind of churn and, and massage and play with. And so that was one of the big conversations. And then I think the other one was, what is the, <laughs> I see subcommittee, what is the right number of subcommittees? And for us, it landed to be about four because you want enough people to make it interesting, but you have to kind of, you know, dive into those subtopics um, but you don't want to dilute it to the point of being ridiculous or, you know, but so that was kind of what we decided. So that, that was it. Um, the Slack is interesting, guys. I don't know if anyone has, has done Slack per se, but it's been um, some people really leaning in and aggressive about it. And then other it's radio silence. And I know there's a few people that we've lost with Slack. So um, I don't know how that's going to go long term. Uh, the good news is we've been off of email for Slack, so that's good. It doesn't clog your inbox. You can go check it, but at the same point, I think Slack is, uh, uh, it probably is going to work eventually, but I think there's a bit of a learning curve that's steeper for some, some members. I'm sorry, I'd like to ask a quick question. So I heard the two committees, I heard monitoring and evaluation and best practices. What are the other two? Engaging with other committees. Oh, that's a committee. Okay, got it. Uh -huh. And um, a little more short term is how I'm thinking about it, but this kind of allowable uses for the Climate Protection Fund. You know, Liz, Thank you. Yeah, Liz has been helping us. We've been trying to ask, well, what exactly would be helpful? And it sounds like it's, you know, info on helping flush out um, criteria and metrics kind of in this more short term contribution to that plan. Got it, thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Lisa and Jay? I have a question, it's Lori. Um, it seems when we go into subcommittees, we don't have enough time to get very deep during our meetings. We have two hour meetings once a month. How are you working with your subcommittees? Is it totally Slack or are they meeting offline or give me some yeah, advice. Separate. Separate, Lori. Yeah, we have, we have, um, we've, we've uh, have separate meetings for the subcommittees. Um, and uh, again, uh, it's to be determined. I, I think, I think a lot of us ended up getting to the summer and it, the, the pace of it slowed down for sure. Yeah, I just can't tell if people will, I mean, we have Google Docs that people go in and in between and add things to, but I just can't tell if there's another level of energy for those subcommittees or if we, so I'll look forward to your wisdom on that. For our allowable uses one, um, there's actually just two of us on that committee, but we met in person and kind of similar to your in-person meeting, Lori, it was just so energizing to have the in-person connection. We actually, to be honest, Mark and I spent the whole first meeting just getting to know each other better. 
And, uh, and now we have a second meeting later this week that's more of a working meeting where hopefully we'll both do what we were kind of tasked to do in between. But I, I did find that the in-person meeting um, was very energizing, like you were saying. And I will say that the subcommittees themselves, when we get there, they're very energetic because people have self-selected to nerd out on those topics. So the energy and the, the conversations are really robust and, and, and invigorating. I think, you know, it's all the other stuff, the planning a meeting and, you know, the, the machinations of organization that, you know, everyone is probably sick of at this point. That's a really good point. It sounds like you're, you have found a way for people to derive more meaning from their experience in the committee where there's still value in everybody meeting and creating structure and coming to consensus around perhaps some issues, but then providing this other venue for getting in deep in the weeds on some issues. Okay. Great, does anybody have any other questions? All right, then we are on to Naomi and Stuart for sustainable transportation. Thanks, Grace. I'm going to start and then invite uh, Stuart and Mike to share anything I missed. So we've had three meetings thus far and kind of an overarching theme and where we've been so far is really trying to orient our committee to the work that's already been done, not only by the CASA office, but our Department of Transportation and Infrastructure. So giving overviews of existing projects, RFPs that have recently been released, um, rules and regulations that have either been approved by agency or at the city council level, as well as kind of a high level, here's what's to come. Um, it's really helpful, I think, especially as we look back and are really starting to dig into our, the task force's recommendations around transportation policies, projects, and whatnot that we can go through and then eventually elevate to this committee as well, and then hopefully the CASER office. So our meeting also has served as a space to really have conversations about those that represent different constituencies and organizations, how they can get involved and support those existing efforts. Um, our meetings as well have carved out time for uh, Mike and Alana to give updates again around what the city is doing. But also we've had some of our committee members that are involved in either regional or statewide efforts around transportation policy projects and whatnot, share um, what's going on so people can feel informed, but also take back that information to their constituencies for their engagement. Um, we have an upcoming meeting uh, this Friday that will really dig into looking at all of the phase one recommendations of the Climate Action Task Force's report on transportation. So those either program ideas, policies, um, just concepts that we think can make the most sense to, to eventually hopefully recommend for the CASER office to work on. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Our past meetings, we've also talked about um, just the decision-making framework that's outlawed and outlaw, outlined in the bylaws. Um, we've talked through our proposed changes to the bylaws, given Mike some feedback on draft criteria to assess the climate protection funds. And we've developed a framework for our meetings going forward. So really trying to break the agendas into what are short-term policies and projects that we can discuss and potentially elevate for action to be taken as well as looking at what are those long-term um, priorities that we can um, look at in terms of what we want to eventually recommend to um, actually be worked on. So those are kind of the high-level things about our meeting. Some things that have come up though is definitely equity. So what criteria will we use um, to evaluate all of the different things in the task force's reports, um, as well as what are some immediate ways that action can be taken outside of the task force's report to, um, to address immediate transportation needs. So um, those are some big things, similar to some of the other groups we use at Google Drive, as well as Slack. Um, the drive is really helping us and stay organized with all of the documents that will go out ahead of meetings. Slack too um, is gonna be a great space to share information outside of meetings. And we've broken up different channels such as multimodal transportation, equity, climate protection fund. And we're gonna have a training, I believe at either uh, our next meeting for those that haven't used Slack. And then we did try to use a Jamboard at the last um, meeting, but had some technical difficulties, but we wanna try and use Jamboards and Menti and other types of voting um, or interactive platforms to help with um, fostering conversation and ultimately decision-making in our meeting. So I'll pause there and then welcome yet yeah, again, Stuart or um, Mike to share anything that I missed. Sure, thanks, Naomi. Um, we have a, an active committee. We have uh, folks with a lot of great ideas. 
and a lot of great ideas from the committees that preceded us. Um, so we're, we're, we're kind of going through a process of educating ourselves about these different options that came up previously, while also keeping an eye to what's needed in the short term, as Naomi said, what's, what's needed now, um, what initiatives can we complement by helping within that framework of, of a project? Uh, is there, are there ways to leverage funding through other grant opportunities where money could be used as a match um, to move something forward? Uh, but ultimately, there's a strong desire to really focus on actionable items um, just as kind of a general guidance, we're looking eventually to have two shorter term um, uh, priorities that we can focus on and then also select um, some longer term. Uh, and the longer term for us might be something that really requires more research and thought uh, versus something that might be short term. Uh, I don't know what it might be, a sudden need to purchase back all the uh, fossil fueled law lawnmowers <laughs> or something this summer. Um, but uh, there are exciting things happening, um, you know, at the, at the, certainly at the state level with the greenhouse gas roadmap unfolding and, and uh, potential for employer trip reduction programs. And, and other types of initiatives uh, that I think are very complementary. So uh, this is really a good time uh, for us to be going through these items and looking at where we can have the greatest effect in, in moving things forward. Um, so that's pretty much what I had. I might wanna ask you more about the short-term and long-term. It sounds like you all have had enough discussion on that to have begun identifying what you might see as short-term needs or a place where you would like to have an impact. Are you at that point where you could share something? Or even if it's just what you're thinking about? Well, we've put a few ideas out there and, and certainly we recognize that uh, a priority for our region is that we are facing a downgrading for air quality. Uh, to the severe um, level. And so this summer really counts. And if you've been following the AQI this week, it's been really bad. So <laughs> there's some immediate needs that are, are quite large. Um, I don't have a specific program in particular. We talked about using incentives. We talked about other things that we can make happen. We like the idea of the e-bike uh, libraries and trying to get that to move forward a little a little more aggressively and, and uh, other ways that we can bring um, mobility to, to the people that are really challenged today in getting around. Thanks for that. And Mike, did you wanna add anything? No, I think that I mean, it's sort of a great job of summarizing all the, all the great work we're trying to cram into these two hour meetings. It's kind of every time we're like, oh my God, we're like done with the meeting. We haven't got to have our agenda. So, so much to talk about, but we're, we're, we're working on it, trying to figure out how we can get these, uh, get things to just find the time, or, you know, focus the conversation better because there's so much we could discuss and there's only so much time in, in the day, but we're working on it and Stuart and Naomi are doing a great job of hurting our, uh, team of very informed and knowledgeable and uh, uh, opinionated cats. Does anybody have any questions for the Transportation Committee? I have a very small one. Stuart, what did you say about e-bikes and libraries? I'm a library yes, um, the first. Denver, that's why. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> well, you know, the idea of the bike library started with a program in, in Northeast, uh, with the Northeast uh, Transportation Connections and Angie Malpiede. Um, she's done that quite well. And adding to that mix within a library of available um, tools are these e-bikes. And so I think the initial focus is going to be on um, the Sun Valley area where um, new lower income housing is coming to um, and a few other spots around the area. Um, and that really, again, is a, a way for people to come and check out a bike 
um, like a library, <laughs> keep it for a period of time and bring that back. And so uh, those are things that we're looking at. Uh, also the idea of potentially putting these bikes near um, affordable housing where they might be needed to get around. And uh, there's a call that went out more recently to look at using e-bikes for delivery services. Um, and I don't know what the response is yet, but by Friday, I think we'll, we'll hear a little more from Mike about that. Thanks, I just heard the word library, so <laughs> more clear. They're not at libraries, gotcha. <laughs> I took a long time to define it for you, huh? <laughs> One thing for everyone, all of our my fellow um, co-chairs, is just if you all come across any tools, I know a lot of folks are participating in the really great DEI training. Um, but one of the things we've been talking about are what are tools that we can use in our discussions to help us in evaluating, you know, some of the the projects and policies and things that we might want to recommend. So if anyone comes across any great tools, definitely love to see those. There's been some that have been shared already among our committee members, but. Just curious what else is out there, what all you all are using in terms of questions you're asking to ensure anything you're elevating is gonna actually meet the, the equity kind of ideals that we see for the funding for the projects and whatnot. Yeah, we broke up a little bit there. I just wanna make sure that was an open question now to everybody. And the question is, are there tools that folks are using in this process of evaluating what you want to work on and how to engage or how to have influence on the Climate Protection Fund evaluation. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Does anybody care to comment? And that's okay. We can always collect that information and come back. I would like to ask a question that, well, they, first off, thank you everyone for your report outs. Um, that was all wonderful to hear and really great to see, see some commonalities among the groups. I'd like to ask a different question. And although we heard a lot about the excitement of our groups and how well-informed everyone is and they like doing this work, um, are we at any risk yet? Um, these groups are big. Uh, they're you know meeting every month can be challenging. Are we beginning to lose people yet? Are you sensing any amount of frustration at folks not yet feeling as engaged as they wanna be or not seeing the progress they thought they might, or that they thought of when they first joined? And if your answer is no, that's fine, but I wanna throw it out there and see what you're thinking or experiencing. Grace, I would say that, you know, our, our first couple of meetings were really more around one, the first meeting really kind of getting to know each other and spent some time with that and then listening to what is already going on. And then the second meeting was kind of, you know, following up, making sure questions. We actually spent time there based on on the, you know, our part within the, the was it the bylaws or whatever that we didn't really talk too much about in the first meeting. But one of the things that Aaron and Katrina and I were talking about is because we've got, I mean, homes and buildings, while there's some commonality, there's quite a bit of difference. And so as we kind of move forward, how do we take the subcommittee idea and move that to where people feel like that they're able to work? And I, that's what I think these subcommittees, it sounds to me like, are doing is getting people, make sure they're talking about the things that are truly passionate and of interest to them. Um, I think that that's going to kind of hopefully help keep us, but I can say part of the reason why we canceled our meeting today, for, you know, and pushed people towards the, the Energized Denver Task Force stakeholder meetings was because, I mean, it's summer, and I think everybody's time right now is extremely much more limited than I think what'll happen once we get back in the fall and school starts and all those other distractions kind of go away. That's just my opinion. Thank you, that's good feedback. Anyone else wanna make a comment about that? I, I think it's a, a real risk um, because again, the mandate's so broad and, and you know, trying to figure out, are you advocates? Are you, I, I, I think it's something we're gonna be struggling with or it's what we work against, trying to organize it 
and make it effective because the default would be what you're describing. And so I feel like I'm just ahead of that, but I, I will tell you that in-person meeting made such a difference. Um, you know, I just heard more and more people owning it and uh, got emails after people saying, you know, I didn't get this idea out, I wanna to talk to you. So um, hopefully, but, but yes, I, Grace, I think that lurks behind us as we do this, even for this group, right? Yes, I've thought about that too. You know, at a certain point, I know this group is going to want to be making decisions and not just reporting out to each other. Um, and I, you know, I acknowledge that and we're going to get to some, hopefully we'll have another, as we, as we get into my portion, we'll have some good weighty discussion that we can bite into. Good. All right. Any other comments then about your committees? Anything else you want us to know? And I hope you noticed in the chat, Kira made a, cop, made a copy version of their Jamboard so that you can all see that. And then you won't accidentally make a change that then the CareJ committee will say, who made that? Um, but definitely take a look at it. Um, I think I'll be, I'll probably be putting it on my list of things to read every week just to make sure that I'm up to speed and checking in on it. So Kira, thank you for doing that. Um, all right, so I am, first off, we're ahead of schedule, so hooray for us. Um, now I'm supposed to give you an update on our office and I thought I'd start out first by giving you an update on things that are not related to the Climate Protection Fund and then we can spend the rest of our time talking about that. Um, and if you have any questions and need to interrupt me before I move on, that's fine. Uh, so first, as was mentioned earlier, we had a couple of launches in the past month since we met last. Uh, the first was the Renewable Heating and Cooling Plan and I'm hoping Taylor or Mike Maybe you can drop a link in the chat while I'm talking to that. That went really well. So what I'm excited to talk about there is back in January, we released our net zero implementation plan, and which of course is focused on uh, new codes to get all of our new construction buildings and homes to net zero by 2030. That launch was not received well Mayor's office got a lot of angry calls. Um, it was a really dense uh, tech, technical report that we just, I don't know, we just didn't do as much planning as we perhaps could have to get our community ready for that to come out. We learned from that. And renewable and heating and cooling was completely different. Um, we really worked on our messaging of what, what did we really want people to understand um, coming out of that, like what is the point? So renewable heating and cooling is about getting our existing buildings and homes. It's one of the pieces of getting our existing buildings and homes to net zero by 2040. And it's specifically about how we can um, reduce the reliance on natural gas end uses in our buildings and homes, but doing it in a sound and logical and achievable way where we're not actually calling for early retirement of any working equipment. And our messaging really focused on the fact that Denver's climate has already changed and it is already much hotter and it's only going to get hotter. And over 30% of our residents do not have cooling in their homes. And simply as a resiliency measure, we, need, we know that people need that. So how can we provide it in a way that doesn't make climate change worse? That message was well received. And what was amazing that we did not plan for is that we happened to launch it on one of the first days when it was 100 degrees. And so the local media really found that um, captivating and whatever press we got on it was all really positive. So I feel really great about that. And um, I think, I don't know, I just think it's really laid some good groundwork for the work we need to do. Uh, the next launch we've had in just the last two weeks on, on July 1st, you probably know that Denver now has a fee on disposable bags in all retail outlets. And um, I tell you, we, have, we had less than five complaints. And in fact, the complaint emails that we got were, um, you know, one person was mostly interested in where could he get a reusable bag because he couldn't find one anywhere. And then a couple of folks who were letting us know about stores that didn't have information up and so they wanted us to do extra outreach, that's it. And there were over 200 different um, news 
uh, pieces about the bag fee launch uh, within the week before and the week after. And again, I think that that just went really, really well. We're still working on actually getting reusable bags out to community-based organizations. We are victims of the global supply chain mess. And uh, in fact, our one of our biggest shipments of bags has now been sitting in the port of Los Angeles, I think for over a month. So it's it's in the United States territory, but it has not been brought onto the land yet and shipped to us. So, um, so if you or any of your organizations are still waiting for bags, we're working on getting them as fast as we can. Uh, but so far it's been going really well. So before I move on, anyone have any questions about either of those launches? Okay, um, our office is growing. So we now have a manager of communications and engagement. Her name is Winna McLaren. She came to us from Denver Public Schools and we're really excited to be growing that unit. And in the next, hopefully in the next two to three weeks, we will actually have a job posting for a community facing position. So we're really excited about that. And I'll make sure that the whole SAC gets notified about that so you can get that out to your folks. And then I'm actually, this is a question for all of you. You know that um, we started our equity training for the SAC members. And I wanted to take a pause to see um, if anyone could comment on how that's going so far. If anyone has participated yet. Mine is later this week, so I haven't been in it yet. Grace, I participated last week, I can't remember, but I thought the training was really great. People were engaged. I think people wanted more time. There's just, you know, a lot of concepts people wanted to really not so much even ask questions, there was like a case study component at the end and people wanted to go through more case studies to really apply the concepts around the, the four eyes of oppression that we learned about. So I think it was great. And that was another kind of my comment before around equity tool that came up as well. Just what are resources that committees can use as they're thinking about um, all of the different ways we can elevate recommendations and how can we um, cross-reference those with um, equity and keeping all of the things in mind that we learned. I, I agree with Naomi, I was in that same training and I think that, um, well, there were some technical issues, I think at the beginning, just using a different platform, um, but I'm sure that'll get ironed out. But then I would just say building in some more time for converse, some discussion and some, um, you know, uh, engaging people a little bit more and, and bringing some people out and, uh, and just some time to talk. Uh, I think that's what people were, were kind of looking for in there, but it was good. Great, thank you for that. Um, okay, so now we can spend the, however much time we want. We actually have plenty of time, but we'll just see how it goes talking about the Climate Protection Fund. So first, let me just give you a basic update on funding, on the funding commitments that we've made. So as was mentioned earlier during some of the report outs, well, really during the transportation report out. So the e-bikes for essential workers, those are this close to being up and running meaning that the libraries are about, the e-bike libraries are very soon going to receive their bikes and they will be operational hopefully by mid-August. Um, obviously this is the kind of thing that we wanna do a big publicity push for. So we're very excited about that. Um, but, and I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm giving the support, Mike could just as easily give the support. Uh, we have also committed to funding the uh, shuttle, uh, the transportation shuttle in Montbello. This is a DOTI funded program. There are going to be three vehicles that will be moving around Montbello, bringing people to and from the transit station. And one of those vehicles will be all electric. And so we have committed to funding that. So we're really excited about that. I think they'll have that, we think they're gonna have that up and running by mid fall, maybe October-ish, we're hoping. Uh, the e-cargo bikes were mentioned earlier. And so this is a, an RFP we put out asking for um, really businesses or organizations that have service delivery needs to tell us how they would use e-cargo bikes. We received three proposals and each one had a different business model and they're each able to scale a different way. And we are looking to fund, hoping to fund all three of them. And so um, when Mike is allowed, he will give us an update on, on how that's going, but we're really feeling very good about that. Um, and then lastly, we had another RFP out for more electric mobility in Montbello, but separate from Dottie. This is really focused on community-based organizations and their needs. And that RFP just closed. So I don't have information about that yet, 
but we're really hopeful. So great for Mike for getting all those RFPs out there and doing his best to spend as much money as he can um, under that category. So good job, Mike. Very happy about that. Okay, so, and I'm sorry, it, for those of you who missed it earlier, I'm, um, I'm on the mend from a cold from re-entering into society. And so I have to keep pausing. This is about as much talking as I can do at any one time. So what I would like to spend time on, and I didn't prepare a Jamboard. Um, I really was looking more for discussion, but I don't mind throwing one up there if we want to do that. But um, the session with CareJ was really helpful. And we are also getting input from our engagements with other community-based organizations, just as we do in our normal course of business in CASR. So we're having conversations with community-based organizations and other advocacy groups to talk about what are the projects that people want to see in their communities? What are the projects and programs that community-based organizations need money to run? The more information we can get about that, the faster we can get to we, CASR, can actually write one or three or five RFPs get them out there into the community so that organizations can, can make proposals to us and we can give them money. And so I would actually like to have that conversation with you if you're willing to entertain that for a little while. So it is a little bit open-ended. Um, I'll also, just to give you some other background too, we have, we've met with the parks department because you know that they have their legacy fund and we need to make sure that we can differentiate. And here I go. Someone's going to have to start this discussion without me because I'm about to go off screen. I'm sorry, I'm back. So it's short, but you don't want, see no one, as this, this is a wonderful thing about the remote world is that now I do not have to go to the office to do my job tomorrow because nobody wants me there. I don't want me there. So um, if you don't mind, then I, I would like to have this discussion with you. So, uh, you know, if it's a really big category, right? Adaptation, uh, resiliency, environmental justice. If I could, let's try for here at the beginning, let's try to focus on what can be done at a community scale to address Denver's top three climate vulnerabilities. That's increased heat, decreased air quality, and primarily from wildfires and increased drought or water scarcity. So again, I would like to talk less and write more. And so, but I am putting all of you on the spot to talk about those subjects, if you don't mind. Grace, can you just finish what you started to say about the Parks Legacy Fund oh, before sorry. you went off? <laughs> yes, so one of the things we, I'll, I'll just use CareJ as an example, the discussion that we um, talked about, and frankly, a lot of our other discussions too, with other groups, we hear trees and community gardens a lot. And there are two other funds that Denver has that can fund both. So the first, the Parks Legacy Fund can fund trees and green infrastructure on the public way. And Healthy Food for Denver Kids is just beginning to fund community gardens but they're really specific because their charge is that they need to get healthy food to children. So community gardens that are being funded this year by that fund really had to demonstrate that their funding would directly relate to actually getting food to children. So we were looking for the space between um, those types of funding where we might fit best. I'm sorry, that's your cue for someone to start talking other than me. Well, I'd like to offer some ideas on the air quality front, just because I, I think that there are several issues that are, are, are hot topics right now. Um, you know, one is that there's this new regulation for new development um, requiring transportation demand management plans to reduce trips. And, and while it's a great ordinance, and like with any new rule that comes in, 
there are some that struggle. And, uh, you know, I've been hearing some of the developers of lower income housing who, um, who, who struggle to, to find enough funding to cover some of the things that these non, that these um, lower income housing uh, units need in mobility. You couple that with the recent change in the parking code with regard to affordable housing, it's now uh, gone down from um, 0.25 per unit to 0.1 per unit, meaning there's one parking space for every 10 dwelling units. And right now it's so hard to get housing built um, that you know they, they can't really offer a whole lot on the side. And I would really like to see you know, things that will make that successful, make it easier for these good developers who are trying to build affordable housing, which is you know, really high on our list of priorities right now. And um, I, I think that the two together um, address air quality issues and mobility needs and, and equity needs. So what, what does the developer need to see? Like, what do they need to be provided, Stuart? Well, it can range from um, even just having um, e-bikes available to their tenants. Um, if they don't offer an eco-pass, some way of creating um, a subsidized or a see if there's enough funding to cover a neighborhood uh, eco-pass you know, these are all the types of things that I think will be important. Uh, car sharing is important. I can't think right now off the top of my head, but there's this new program where tenants within a building who have a car and they leave it in their parking spot during the day can potentially rent out their cars to other tenants. So it becomes an automatic car sharing um, and allows some of those tenants to earn some money. These are really good ideas. And I think right now the developers are kind of going, you know, what, what do we do <laughs> and what can we afford? And, and I think we can point them in the right direction and we can help them with a few of the items that, that are necessary um, to help people get mobile. Thank you for that. I hadn't heard that one before. I'll jump in on a few, but they're, they're ones that we're still grappling with. So they're un, unripened um, on trees. I think, uh, Grace, you heard, there's certainly people that are concerned that if you, in our committee, that if you plant a lot of trees and they're non-natives, you're, you know, you're addressing heat, but not water. So I think we need to have more discussion about that. But I think um, what I hear from parks is the city forester can do trees on public lands, but hasn't jumped off and started doing that in any kind of way. So I think the opportunity is to leverage that, to match funds, not worry so much that, that they should be funding it, but maybe encourage them to spend money there by some kind of incentive. Um, Colorado Trust for Public Lands also couldn't make the last meeting, but there's a, a very good pilot on tree planting that's coming, I think from Chicago, that I need to find out more about. But I think on the tree front, there's an awful lot we could do. I think, in, I think um, planting trees on all our schoolyards and our libraries um, is just one quick initiative that you've already got the land, get the trees there. So that's the public end, then there's the private end, and that's much harder and seems to be accompanied in people's minds. You know, the New York Times just did this article, the rich have trees in their neighborhoods, but they're not in lower equity neighborhoods. And our committee is certainly talking a lot about, um, I know parks right now for public has a workforce of 200 kids. They're training in native habitat conversion and tree planting. It's funded for two years by Great Outdoors Colorado at $500,000 for two years. So extending that, leveraging it, um, but then also maybe creating the same kind of thing for private lands, landowners in uh, low equity neighborhoods. And uh, all I'll say on water, which is a giant subject is the park system in Denver is the number one water consumer in Denver. So it seems to me there's again a chance for leverage, but I haven't even looked into it. So that's all, all the ideas I can think of. 
Oh, Lori, I don't on your uh, just to piggyback on your tree thing um, theme, I should say. Um, the downtown Denver partnership actually has a full time arborist on staff now. And there's a program in downtown where they figured out that the way we've been planting trees in an urban area is not the best way to plant them and make them live for any good length of time. And so they've learned how to create a better planters that are going to provide, you know, better watering systems, thus hopefully reducing the amount of water because it's actually just feeding the, the exact amount of water that it needs. And they've actually got grants that companies apply for to have those trees planted on their properties um, to create a better downtown urban canopy. And the 16th Street Mall is being redone. It's going to start, I think, this fall. And they actually show pictures of many, many, many full-size trees that they that are living out at some piece of land that are going to be ready to be brought in as soon as all of that construction gets done. So there is some some other news on what's going on with some of the trees. That's fabulous. Thank you. Yeah, I'm very excited about trees. I just, I don't have the vision yet, but the committee will get it. I'd like to weigh in on a, on a different topic. Um, it's it's uh, relates with something from Curious Jamboard also around like a promotora model. So investing in community-based maybe promotora model approaches, especially to around health related vulnerabilities, which fits with increased heat and decreased air quality. Um, I think that there can be multiple ways that this can impact, um, reduce health vulnerabilities. So some of this can be, you know, um, expanding access to healthcare coverage, um, a door-to-door -door approach for that, of course. Um, also some of the social, just checking on each other, checking on neighbors, um, trying to, um, it's also education, public health education, door-to-door -door with the Promotora model, um, kind of catching, helping people catch, you know, signs and symptoms of heat distress or breathing difficulties before it reaches a more severe um, state um, where then emergency care is needed and then the financial hits that come from that. Um, so, so lots of co-benefits there um, that I think a community-based approach um, could benefit. Lisa, you were like, you set it up perfectly. Thank you. <laughs> I was going to suggest, always, always will suggest um, promotora's um, models, programs within communities to educate neighbors, but also just like fun um, activities for neighbors in general to come out and um, do like hands-on learning. We had an event a couple of weeks ago where we were able to teach people how to take recycled materials and like build stuff out of it for your garden. But being able to bring people from community to, you know, their neighbors um, in, a, in a space that folks are familiar with um, and like do hands on um, learning with people how to, you know, break generational cycles that we've been conditioned into on, you, you know, this is how you cook this sort of vegetable or, um, you know, you can do X, Y, and Z with a plastic bottle to water your, your garden or whatever it may be. So um, 100% down for that. I appreciate that. And now I'm going to throw, uh, let's see, I'll just throw this question out there to the group. Let's play devil's advocate for a minute. I, we, we all in Castor, we all support the community education concepts and promotoras. The, everything about education in general as being something that we should fund through the Climate Protection Fund. We are still working on how do we measure that, measure the impact of that um, against the requirements of the fund. I think equity, check that box, not a problem. Um, how do we measure the, or how might you recommend that we measure the impact or report the impact of educational programs that we can't directly tie to some other tangible improvement like greenhouse gas emissions reductions or an improvement in transportation um, or reduction in energy use? So, so let's, for the pretend we're, let's pretend we're talking to our detractors. Sorry, go ahead, Armando. 
So the investment in education, is it in like primary, secondary, post-secondary? Um, what are we thinking? About? I think the idea here is generally educating the public. So with the Promotora model, it's the idea of using, having, having community residents be the voice of our issues rather than we here in this group. Right? It's in addition to us, but actually reaching people where they're at with their trusted messengers. Well, one one model, I, educating the public, I, I do think the, the school models are important here. And I just want to share an example from my own personal life, how I got into uh, science. Um, when I was in community college, there was um, a program called the STEPS program through the National Institutes of Health, which funded undergraduate research programs. It was basically a stipend that paid... Um, paid uh, principal investigators, like lab leaders, to basically pay a living wage. I think it was like $12 an hour, something like that, which was a living wage 10 years ago. Um, and uh, I got to do my first hands-on research, and it was it was involved in, in health. And um, so what I did is I actually went into the uh, Bear, Bear Creek River system and did like water quality testing, like community water monitoring here in Colorado. Um, so that was one use of um, like some funding, community education funding, and from there I was able to like, you know, get lab education and kind of like grow from that and grow basically an entire career off of um, off of a, a public um, just a stipend for, for research at the community college level. Um, and you know, the fidelity with that was, you know, my understanding. Everybody in that program went on to you know stay in science and, and do those kind of things. Um, so as, as far as like community education goes, that's just one thing for my own life that I think might be, you know, you could find, um, you could provide a stipend for, you know, a community college student that wants to research renewable energy or research direct air capture or, you know, some other, you know, method that's going to have an impact here, um, a technological solution and, um, you know, provide them a pretty modest amount of, of money to, to, you know, invest in that, in that person's education in the future. Um, so, yeah, that's one thing. That's a great idea. Thank you. I heard all that. Anyone else? So, Grace, I'm wondering, you know, what kind of programs are there currently going on that we might be able to play off of and expand? So the first one that kind of pops in my head would be like, you know, I know there's some community gardens out there, for instance, right? So how do you find people that have that passion that we can then work with to create a way to bring you know kids whatever age into into the area to start learning what do then plants do around you know with their effect on the environment and how do they clean the air and you know while they're kind of going through that piece and so it's you know back to kind of Armando maybe it's kind of flipping it there's there's a little bit of a money of money from the standpoint of making sure that somebody's getting paid to create this kind of little curriculum, but is there money then that can make sure that the, the kids that are coming in, whether it's that, you know, we're providing something as basic as lunch or, you know, is it that they get t-shirts or, you know, those kinds of things to start getting them excited um, at that early level to understand the very basics of it. And then as they get older, then you can kind of take them step by step through, you know, Till, till, you know, in high school, but then by high school, they're ready to understand the bigger challenges and tackle those from a level of, of understanding as we built them through that building block. But we're hitting them in their community versus through the school or something like that, right? That has a, I'm going to school, it's not as exciting as I'm going to go, you know, hang out at the community garden with my friends for the day or something like that, maybe. And actually, you just reminded me of one of the ideas that we are looking into. Um, that our, our friends at DITO, our colleagues at DITO, have a workforce development program that provides a road to entry into uh, construction careers. And we're looking, we're actually considering adding a module to that training program that would be specific to green building, construction, design, electrification. So again, the it's like, it's what you're talking about, but with an older cohort. So the people going through that cohort who are coming out with um, certifications in HVAC or construction would then also come out with um, another additional certification that is related to the work that we want to see being done in the building trades. Well, I'll have to remind, I just have to remind myself of that. Right. 
So we're working on a apprentice program for the building engineers, right? Because the buildings are only, only going to be as effective from a standpoint of reducing energy usage as the person who's running it, right? But the problem that I think I've seen when we've kind of done some of these high school career kind of conversations is there's still not as much of an understanding of what it means to talk about green jobs and green. And so I think trying to get kids interested earlier than high school. Cause you know, by the time they've gotten to high school a lot of them already start having ideas and start putting up roadblocks to, oh, I know I'm gonna go down this path or <clears throat> whatever. And I think we also see that in high school there's still that barrier that you know any kind of job that doesn't require a college degree is a second class job. And we've gotta get people understanding that there's incredible living wage jobs by being a, a plumber or an HVAC technician I mean, our building engineers, by the time you're a chief, you know, you're in, you could be in six figures. So, I mean, you know, there's lots of incredible jobs that don't require that, but we've got, how do we get the kids before they actually get to high school and are already been pushed down certain tracks and we can't now divert them, right, as easily? Um, also on education, it just strikes me, um, for waste, for recycling and composting. I mean, you really can't move into those programs without a huge public education piece. So in, in those areas, I, th I think it just folds in with the overall effort, whether you can measure it or not. I don't think you're gonna have much trouble justifying it. Um, and I think if we do, if we move to pays, for instance, it's gotta be a big piece of it um, or you just won't have public acceptance. Does that fit into what you're talking about, Grace? Well, I like that we're getting our ideas out. Again, I, I often think, I'm a little cynical. And so I often think of um, the detractors who I have to justify things to, right? That's kind of the lowest common denominator is if I need to say to someone, yeah, I funded this and here's why. And um, that's, that's where my brain's going. But this is just as effective. This is a perfectly fine use of the time as far as I'm concerned, because it's still, we're getting these ideas out there. And what's helpful to me and to our team is the more we hear the same messages from different people, that's how we know that these are the things we need to pursue. Because then we, we know that we've got, um, you know, the support behind us. I Lisa, think, I want to make sure it looked like, yeah, you had something yeah, like that. Thank I wanted to add that I, I think it's an important question about the detractors. I think that part of the work too is the ongoing uh, communication, maybe education of with the detractors that like all these investments in climate adaptation with, you know, um, how we measure that, what the outcome is, isn't going to be counting greenhouse gas emissions. It is going to be things like, what's the change in um, the uninsured rate in a neighborhood? That is, if you lower that rate, that is climate adaptation. And, and people don't always still, um, some of the detractors may not be, connect those dots. So, so I think that there's a lot that can be measured. Um, I think part of it too is potentially then with the RFPs, I, I'm assuming the RFPs will be written this way that m and &E is, is part of everything, but making sure that for these particular ones where the measurement might seem not as clearly green or climate, um, but it's in the realm of, of human like health and thriving or finances or um, that that um, that the the, the it, what am I trying to say that um, that it's it's clear in the RFP and in what's funded that the how that will be um, measured and if partners you know I'm thinking of our committee again like academic partners social science partners public health partners can be you know need to be brought in to help with that it's a good a good um, contribution as well I'm not sure if that last point came through clearly but uh, but basically I think my to repeat my main point that measuring adaptation it's it may not look the way people are expecting it to look and we I think we just have to keep putting the word out there that all of these other investments are investments in adaptation you know there's a lot of home health monitoring devices that we're doing at UC health that could easily play into this where you could you know do an intervention 
and you could monitor a population or, you know, maybe you have a control in there too, to, to see what the Delta would be, you know, is there a difference if you have, you know, air quality measures or, you know, community medical trainees or just, you know, simple, simple things um, as proof of concept. So I'm not sure if that plays into it, but that's, that's very, very powerful data, particularly if you can see a, you know, a, a change in, in the health of a population after an intervention. That's all very easily, easy to do. I think with a partner, you know, I work at UC Health, but I think any hospital system or healthcare partner that does home monitoring like that could, could easily yield that data. Well, I, I agree with Jay. I think there's, there's a lot of opportunity for programs that already exist that are doing interventions like that. The weatherization assistance program, um, the low income home heating assistance program. Um, and I know specifically with building at homes, part of the challenge, challenges that we see with electrification, one of them is just the ubiquity of the technology. So, you know, partnering with one of those programs to do a pilot of like, okay, we're going to fund the incremental cost to do heat pumps in these homes. Uh, where previously they just had a natural gas fired furnace um, and we'll, we'll pay the additional cost to put in a heat pump. So we're also providing cooling along with, with, the, with new heating. Um, and you know, we wouldn't be footing the entire bill because there's programs that already exist to help fund those types of interventions. Um, I think there's, there's just a lot of opportunity for partnerships like that. And then like Jay was saying, to do that. Um, sort of monitoring or, or verification on, on top as well. Grace, it's almost kind of like the days when, remember when they were first starting to get fire alarms and carbon monoxide um, detectors in homes and things and the fire department would come out and install them. Are there things like that that, because I feel like that when that was, when the installation was happening, there was conversations happening within the home that helped people educate the homeowner, and those were often happening within communities, right, that were not necessarily, you know, understood or were aware or, you know, their landlord hadn't done it and they didn't know they should have or whatever those things might be. Um, but that's a kind of a dual-edged sword. So to Jay's point, if that's, you know, installing this monitor in the home, but then there's that time for the personal conversation and education to happen. And sometimes we might just have to understand that touch points is a measurement of, of success, right? I mean, we, we made these touch points and I don't, you know, whether it's the number of kids that came to a program or whether it's, you know, the number of, you know, people within that family that now we've educated about X, Y, Z or whatever, I think that that should be something that can at least begin the level that we're expanding. So I'm gonna put that in bold in my notes, touch points are a measure of success. That's very helpful. And a lot of what I'm hearing talked about here, it does go back to the Promotora discussion earlier. And I know that, you know, and I'm looking at Kira now, Kira J spent a lot of time talking about that. That again, depending on the audience that we want to reach, there are messengers other than us who would be best suited to delivering that information to our, uh, to our different constituents. I just wanted to share, um, you know, I'm a big proponent of community-based social marketing with regard to transportation, especially with um, immigrants. And, you know, this has been done so successfully for 15 years in Seattle, in Portland. It's, uh, you know, uh, community-based social marketing is also very popular in the UK. All of these programs are measurable from uh, vehicle miles travel reduction um, factor that can be converted into emission reduction factors. And, and like you say, Grace, um, finding those right agents. Uh, the way in Seattle that they tailor the community-based social marketing really depends on the community. Um, I know one community where a key component was educating the merchants along their main shopping street to um, encourage alternative modes to get coffee shops to give a free coffee to someone who came by bike or whatever that might be and distributing information and, and doing things to create community leaders. Um, and not, not to drag this on, but in, in Houston, they found two very important characteristics about the Vietnamese community and then the Spanish speaking community. 
Um, they found, uh, it, you know, this is just kind of part of community-based social marketing that um, they learned from folks and in the Vietnamese community, you gain credibility through the paper. And, you know, somebody who's credible to you will matter far more in changing behavior than anything else. Um, where Houston found with the Spanish speaking folks, the best way to influence a household is to stand at the schools at the end of the day when they're picking up their kids and handing out flyers to the moms and getting the moms to talk. I'm not generalizing, but these were success stories. And I think we can do that with different parts of our community. And it doesn't have to be ethnically different. I mean, um, just getting out there and getting everybody to understand a common message and building it off of practices that are measurable from other areas and have been credible enough to carry weight with state agencies and federal agencies. Um, all of that would come together quite successfully, I think. Hey, um, I also put it in the chat, but I just want to highlight it again for um, the out loud conversation that's happening too. Because I don't want to lose the importance of having community members being able to define how they want to tackle these issues within the priorities that the um, city is setting. Because I think once that is done, it's going to be much easier to be able to figure out, you know, how do we measure it? Um, like someone said earlier, and I think I, I put in my first comment, you know, it might not be the scientific terms that we're looking for, but um, it's a step towards, when we talked about this in the care chain meeting, like it's a step towards that ultimate goal that we have. We have to first start with education to be able to start with, you know, breaking down, um, you know, uh, the gener generational barriers um, to ultimately realizing the ultimate goal that we have. Like <clears throat> we have to build that roadmap slowly and community members have to be part of the decision-making and co-creation um, of that and thus the measures too. So just wanted to put that up there again. That's a good point, Kira. And I think in um, some of the presentations we've given about the Climate Protection Fund, one of the examples that we use in those two very malleable categories is the idea of doing a community-based needs assessment and that that would be something that we would begin with, begin this journey with, um, with community-based organizations is allowing them, empowering them to run that process in their community. And then the second phase then of our engagement with them would be then funding some of the work that they and their communities have determined is important for them to do. If I'm hearing you right. That'd be dope. Okay. Well, now I don't want to belabor the conversation. I do enjoy where this is going, but it does seem like there's most people who have wanted to speak have spoken. Are there any other remaining thoughts or ideas you want to leave us with? Grace, if we had follow up thoughts, what's the best way to kind of process that? Because some of these some of this may need a little bit of maturation in or even in our own minds or maybe further discussion. That would be fine. Um, so a couple things. One, certainly you can always email me and um, I guess I can put my email in the chat, but you guys all have it, but this way it'll be recorded. Um, so there's that, but maybe I should use Kara's model and set up, um, set up like a Jamboard for us to just use as a repository, right? Where you can just go in and leave ideas we can look at that too. I try, I'm really trying not to give you all a lot more work because you're already running a committee. Um, and so maybe the next thing for you guys to do actually is work on your additional ideas through your committee and report that back in the way that works best for all of you. I'm seeing some nods and thumbs up on that. Thank you, Taylor, for putting my email in the chat. All right. Um, we still have time left, but I feel like this has been a good and productive meeting. Um, and the, on the um, agenda, I had put that we could take some time for announcements. If any of you have announcements from your organization you want us to know about or other things happening in your community. Does anybody have anything you'd like to discuss? Um, Armando, you're on. We're doing an event um, coming up next Sunday to um, I think, well, I'm sorry, August 7th, actually. We're opening a community center in Elyria, Swansea. 
Um, we're hoping to put some nonprofit organization behind it. Um, we're kind of going through the effort with that. Um, but it's going to be called the Greenhouse, and we're going to work on community efforts for District 9 and just being really responsible in the over area. Um, and I think this event's going to just raise some, just some awareness and hopefully um, educate about specifically Suncor Refinery. Um, also, I would just like to open up, I'm just curious about if anybody knows specifically about um, Suncor, and uh, I know there's been some work around these specifically, but I'm just wondering about specifically what type of games they're outputting. If the possibility exists for capturing those in some type of like distribution process, um, and if so, like what do those numbers look like? Um, so Armando, I had a really hard time hearing you. We're having a hard time hearing you. So I'm going to follow up with you to um, to get those notes so I can put it in our meeting minutes. But I heard the word Suncor. And so I'm going to put a link in our, I'm going to put a link in the chat to our webpage, our website on that subject. Um, unless Taylor beats me to it. Why can't I find it? Oh, here it is. I got it. We actually have recently updated the information on our website about Suncor. And I would, I'm going to, we're going to share this with all the SAC as well. But this is a really important landing page. Um, we understand that our stakeholders, CASR stakeholders, would like to see us out front and doing more about um, the issue of the many issues surrounding Suncor. Uh, however, as the city and county of Denver, our Department of Public Health and Environment leads our effort on that because that's where all of our scientists are. That's where all of the air quality um, monitoring work is done. But they did a really good thing this year. They actually banded together with their colleagues at other agencies. So Tri-County Health, um, City of Commerce City, City of Adams City, and Jefferson County. And those agencies together came up with a very long menu of things that they believe the CDPHE, Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, that they believe that agency has the authority to do on this issue. We have posted that list to our website in as much layman's terms as we could get it. And we translated it into Spanish. And so this is available for all community organizations who are interested in this subject to use for their own information and to share it with their um, constituents as well. So hopefully you and others will be able to go to that link and share it with anyone who needs it. Any other okay, announcements? Okay, thank you guys. Sorry about that. Sure, no problem. problem. I think, um, well, the Suncor issue may very well be addressed the day we get downgraded to severe, because at that point, you have to cut your VOCs in half, and you don't have a choice. And EPA can mandate a lot of these things. And I, I think looking forward to that January 1st, and right now the likelihood is extremely high that it will happen, um, there will be some significant changes, and not necessarily changes that we're gonna particularly like. And um, it's just, I've been through the transition having lived in LA with the various levels of non-attainment, but we're heading into a very, a category that will be very, very restrictive. Uh, coupled with that, we've been trying to get ahead of the curve and ahead of this downgrade by de developing this employer trip reduction rule. It goes to a public hearing in August can't remember if it's the 17th or the 19th. And right now, there's tremendous um, pushback from chamber types right now saying it's going to chase away business. But all it really does is requires employers to provide information and incentives um, to use alternative modes. There will be specific goals on mode shares by area that will be developed and it isn't forced down an employer's throat in the sense that they have to make their employees get on the bus, but they do need to create a, uh, an incentive or an encouraging environment for that. And I, I think it's a win-win-win across the board, but we're right in the midst of a lot of disinformation that's out there and people who will support this um, to get this passed in August, this will be a very significant reduction in um, mobile source pollution and uh, anything that we can do to support that 
I, I think is critical at this point. All right, thanks for that. And Stuart, so that's the kind of information that when we send this monthly email to the, all the SAC members, that's the kind of information we should probably have a section of like news you should know. Um, so I'll come to you for more information on that. Great, thank you. Great, thank you. Anyone else? All right, well, thank you, SAC members. It was lovely to see you again. Thank you for tolerating my going off screen once in a while. And um, stay cool. And I guess for us, I'll look for a date in September for us to meet again. And until then, enjoy those committees and we'll be getting our first e-newsletter out to all of you in early August. So enjoy the rest of the summer. Thank you very much. And thank you to our translators.